Fundstrat's Tom Lee says it's temporary, a temporary moment of pain and a buy the dip opportunity. He joins me now post nine to make that case. Good to see you again. I'm glad you're here in person, too. So so you don't think that much changed this week? Uh, I mean, I think the narrative got muddled because that CPI report was a disappointment. But it was driven by what, it, what we'd call stubborn components, shelter, auto insurance. You know, the median core CPI component now has only 1.7% year-over-year inflation. I mean, inflation is normalizing. It's just not evident in the total picture. So the PCE in a couple of weeks is going to be more favorable, we think, than these latest inflation reads. And I know what everybody says about it's, you know, it being the Fed's favored measure on, on where inflation is. But are you entertaining the idea that this is not going to be as easy as you once thought it was going to be for this last mile and therefore the market can't do what you once thought it could? Uh, I mean, I th I'd say that that's really the narrative disruption this week, you know, because now the Fed has three inflation reports that it can't argue against that are a little hotter than expected. And the bulls can't really explain them away either, can they? That's right. So what we would need to see is April and May CPI improvements, which is in the future, um, and then keeps the Fed from standing in the way of the economy. What we don't want is a Fed that wants to further slow the economy, which is rate hikes. And I think if they just do even one hike this year, it's still a, actually a good environment for stocks. One, one cut, you mean? Sorry, one cut. Yeah, let's yeah. be clear. See, that's a Freudian slip. I mean, because the, you know, the, the greatest fear of all is that they're going to have to hike again, however remote that possibility seems today. And even if you put into the the, the soup, all the Fed commentary that we've gotten of late just seems to be push off rather than push up. That's right. And I think it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's even this CPI does look like it's somewhat sticky. PCE, as you pointed out, is more cooperative and PPI is and measures like trueflation show inflation much softer, emission inflation expectations much lower. So I think at some point we could also just ask, is, is CPI a bit aberrant? What about the valuations of the market? How do you counter the argument that they're just way too stretched? Multiples are just way too rich, given what now is likely to be the case of cuts later on. Uh, I mean, I think when someone looks at 20 years of history, that's the argument they'll make. If they look at 90 years of P.E. multiples versus interest rates, when the 10 years between 4 and 5 percent, which is a pretty big range, the median P.E. is 20 times. So we're, we're not even at a median P.E. multiple of what's existed whenever the 10 years been in this range. So and then if you look at the median stock, it's actually at 16 times. I'd say that there's upside to earnings. I think multiples can expand. I don't think 5,200 is the ceiling for stocks this year. What, it, what, what feels like the right, the right ceiling now? Uh, I, I know this is uh, going to be tough for investors to, to embrace it, but I think something like 56, 5,700 is probably where the S&P exits the year, maybe much, even much, higher. Much more backloaded into that than you once thought? Uh, I think it's still backloaded because we'll have the cuts behind us and we'll have visibility into 2025 earnings, which probably could be 270, maybe 280 next year. Well, when you say we'll have the cuts behind us, are you so sure? Right. So let's just take June off the table. Let's, for argument's sake, no June. Yeah. You think the first one's in July? Or it could be September. But it. But it, that's why I asked you if the, if the, the move in the market that you just suggested is backloaded. Because yes. you're not going to get a big move until you see the first cut. At that, this point, now there's a lot of disbelief in the market. That's right. And, Scott, one thing to keep in mind is the probability of a June cut has been reduced, but it, it can come back if we have a good April and May CPI, because then it's going to put back into focus what is the trend in CPI. It does feel stubborn when you look at January, February, March. Our next guest's latest piece points to the Fed interest rate challenge. Rate cuts are now a matter of if, not just when. That's the headline for his latest piece. Nick Timoros is Wall Street Journal's chief economics correspondent. And Nick, this week really did throw a big curveball into things. I think people are rapidly trying to rethink when or if the Fed is going to cut interest rates. What are you hearing? Well, Becky, the Fed doesn't cut for free, right? That's been the story uh, since the pivot in December. And you needed to see, I think, at least one of two things, either weakening in the labor market a meaningful slowdown in the economy, that would certainly get the Fed in a position to cut. Or you would need to see inflation, you know, coming back down at least to 2.5% uh, with evidence that it's going to get to 2% in a reasonable time frame. And it looked like for the last couple months we might get that. 
And now after the CPI report on Wednesday, you have to wonder. So, you know, this year is beginning to feel a little bit like the reverse of 2015. Of course, in 2015, the big question was, when was the, the Fed going to do the first hike? When were we going to have liftoff? And at the end of 2014, Fed officials were talking about multiple hikes in 2015. And then the economy kept hitting, you know, pockets of weakness. And they pushed back the, the, you know, to the end of the year. The Fed only hiked once in 2015. So this feels like it could be like that. The big question is, when are we going to have the cuts? And right now, uh, you're, you're having to reset the clock because of what happened on Wednesday. It feels a little different than 2015 to me, just because I think part of the issue here is the economy is so strong. You know, we, we haven't seen that weak economy that would necessarily argue for Fed cuts. Inflation has been the one issue, but I, I guess if you're looking at the overall economy, there's there's two pretty different takes. If you think this is a situation where the economy is really strong, the jobs market is still kicking along, um, but inflation is bumping up and down. And, and the one thing I'd say is yesterday's PPI number, producer prices, were in line with expectations yesterday. So maybe that's kind of leaning to the camp of a bumpy up and down situation before they can get inflation to where they feel more comfortable. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I would say 2015 was the mere opposite of what we have right now. Back then, Fed officials were revising down their projections of the long run interest rate. Now they're revising it up because the economy has been so strong. And I think you're right. I mean, there are three basic scenarios here. One is that we still have this bumpy path down that the Fed chair, Jay Powell, has been talking about. It's just bumpier. Uh, it's not happening as quickly as maybe we thought when we were looking at those six-month annualized inflation rates uh, at or even below 2% at the end of last year. You know, the second scenario, which you have to put a lot more mass on after Wednesday, is that, all right, inflation might just stall out closer to 3%. If you're looking at the PCE index, maybe it's a little bit below 3%, but it's closer to 3 than to 2 And with strong growth, I think that just gets you a high for longer uh, we just stay here at a 5.3% Fed funds rate for longer. Uh, this is, you know, this isn't the worst thing in the world for the Fed. It does make it harder for them to get onto that golden path that Austin Goolsby is talking about. Um, the, the worrying scenario, of course, would be a slowdown in growth with high inflation. Uh, that's the place that the Fed just doesn't want to be. But it doesn't feel like that's where we are right now. We have our early read on last month's consumer spending ahead of the government's own numbers. Our senior economics reporter, Steve Leisman, joins us right now with the CNBC NRF retail monitor. Looking forward to hearing this. What do you Here think? we go. Consumers, Becky, continued moderately strong spending in March spending. That looks even better when you consider that inflation, the consumer side of inflation, is flat and even negative when it comes to goods. The CNBC NRF retail monitor, we get real credit card spending data from Affinity Solutions. It shows retail sales, ex-autos and gas, that's our headline number, up 0.4%. That compares with a 0.4% gain in February. Uh, year over year remains the same at 2.7. And then do core retail, which takes out restaurants, and we're 0.2 versus 0.3. But don't get too excited because it's 0.23 versus 0.27. That rounding is not that big a deal. I'm calling it a wash. Um, but the year-over-year uh, -year did tick down. Still a strong number, 2.9% versus 3% in February. Take a look at the history. Considerable volatility over the past several months. But spending has now bounced back into positive territory for two months in a row now. After that January decline, people thought maybe that January decline was the beginning of this long-awaited consumer slowdown. Well, we're still waiting for that, as you might imagine, Becky. Uh, looking ahead now um, at the sectoral breakdown, we have a pretty much even uh, uh, split here. Three up, three down, um, total six up, six down. But the non-store retailers, that's your internet, up 2.5%. That's strong. Food and beverage, that's strong, up 1.2%. Sporting goods and hobbies, good to see that sector up strong. That's a completely or almost completely discretionary topic. But there's all your home-related stuff, furniture and home furnishings. Building and garden supplies both down in a big way in the month of, uh, of March. Um, electronics and appliances down 2.3%. It's interesting. You had a big decline in prices for both of those. Appliances could be related to a weak housing market. Electronics could be related to just some deflation on televisions and that kind of stuff. All right. Despite higher overall inflation, goods inflation, you can see here, has been flat to negative in eight of the past 12 months. You might have missed this when you were blinded, perhaps, by the, 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 the uh, shining light of higher inflation numbers. But the goods part 
actually has been flat or negative. Consumers are looking for value, and there's a competitive market out there, says the NRF, bristling at the idea that there's price gouging going on by retailers. But this could also mean something to think about possible margin pressure depending upon what's happening with the input costs and the labor costs. We get a piece of the input cost today. We get import prices at 830 this morning. Yesterday's wholesale price report suggested only modest price pressure for those input costs. This is the six-month anniversary of our CNBC NRF index. And here's how it looks relative to the census data. I'm going to say this looks um, relative to the data generally tracking it a bit more stable. Of course, we don't have to revise this data because we're using real data on the inputs from credit cards. We get the um, census guys on Monday, the retail sales report, um, and this number here is in line with where the consensus is on the census retail data. Okay, I want to take this and add it to what we heard earlier this week from the Bank of America Institute. Okay. Because they actually saw spending up for the month of March. I think it was a gain uh, on households because they're looking at real households too. They have something yeah. like 69 million households and small businesses that they're watching. Um, consumer card spending per household up 0.3 percent year over year in March, but that was boosted because the early year over year or month to month 0.3. Year over year, three, up 0.3 percent, following a leap year that was boosted by 2.9 percent. So they saw real big numbers in March, okay. February because of the leap I year. I think if there's 2.9, is that relative to 3 or 2. Point? I'm looking at the numbers okay. right here. All right. Um, up 0.3 percent year over year in March. Uh, but when you adjusted it, you know what, though? It says year over year, but I bet you're right. I bet it's month it's over month. It's got to be month over month. The decline when they adjusted. I want to interrupt you real quick. They had conniptions, to use the Yiddish phrase, with the leap year. Right. Yeah. We, it's terrible. It's but hardly it's hard just, to do. You can't adjust it. It's not just the leap year, but right. then you had Easter that got pulled into March, and that maybe pulled from April. Did you so ever say, see the algorithm for Easter? Adjusted, it was actually numbers that were down. Yeah. If you seasonally. It's hard. What well, we did, uh, I'm glad you asked this, Becky. Another brilliant question. Um, first of all, leap year gave us terrible fits last, last month. We actually pulled the data back before we published it to go over it one more time because one extra day on 30 days is, is a big number. Yeah. What we did with this comparison, and thanks to Matt Shea, who's really smart economist of the NRF, who I work with on this stuff. Um, not Matt Shea, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Matt is his first name, but I'll get it. His last name. No, Matt Shea is the president. Oh, yeah. Uh, the economist I work with there. I'm just oh. having a, a senior moment here. But um, what we did is, for this comparison purposes, we threw out the 29th day. Okay. To compare March to February, Okay. And the February game for this purposes, but we did. But then, if you remember, you have Easter that gets pulled into March, which makes March on the year over year look weirder too. It does, except for I do believe that the X11 seasonal adjustment software program, mm -hmm. I think it takes care of that. Okay. I think it does. Okay. But these are squirrely moments here for the retail index. Right now, I'm seeing zero four versus zero four looks pretty good to me. I saw um, the split between six up and six down in the sectors and the categories with a lot of that weakness associated with housing. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I still see a good amount of discretionary spending going on. What I think matters here is we're my overall take on the economy right now is there are a lot of risks out there, but not a lot of evident weaknesses. Risks become weaknesses. So I'm, I'm worried about that. We have the risk of the consumer slowing down. I don't see the weakness of this consumer slowdown. Because we have been looking for this. For We've been, how long? <laughs> Good to be here. Um, sure. well, I hope you can deal with all this noise, but nice to have a lot an of noise, IPO, yeah. right? Never say that's a bad uh, thing. IPOs are always a good thing. <laughs> Brings more capital into the market, expands the capital markets. Yeah, actually, I would, might want to get to that with you, but let's start off with the earnings themselves. Right. You know, on the call, you're talking about the uncertain backdrop, of course, but it doesn't mean there's a lack of opportunities. You had decent inflows this quarter, interestingly more into fixed income, perhaps, than other areas, although maybe Maybe that was expected. I, I think in, the, in, the, in, the, in a period of so much uncertainty, um, with growing fear, more anxiety throughout the world, people are staying a little close. And, you know, we've had $9 trillion of money now into money market funds, record levels, and some of that money is going into fixed income. Um, 
But the alternative, though, if you were fully invested in the equity markets, you would have made 25 percent return. So, and this is what I try to talk about. It's not about the moment. Yes, there's uncertainty, but over the long run, do you believe in American-style capitalism? Do you believe in the markets? And over the long run, I do believe our markets are going to continue to be driving excess returns above what you could earn in a money market fund. Right. And on the call, you talked about what you believe are still great opportunities, your words, for investors across a number of structural trends. I might expect that those include the likes of what? AI? What else? Well, the combination, AI cannot truly happen unless there's a huge investment in infrastructure. Um, the, the amount of energy that is required for AI for, is enormous. The amount of power generation. We, are, we will run out of electricity if we are going to fully adapt to a full AI world. And so the need to build out, and this is all going to stimulate our economy, by the way, to build out of more AI, and w which at the backside is that means building out more electricity power, whether well, the that data is centers, obviously, data centers that and all that. And, it, so much and we're going to have to be building out, you know, tens and tens of giga, you know, gigawatts, not like, not megawatts, gigawatts. And that's, we're talking trillions of dollars of investing. And so the opportunity is enormous in the coming years. And this is one of the fundamental reasons why I believe the United States is leading this. But let's be clear, I'm talking to political leaders in other countries and that the, their desire to build up data centers, AI, technology, at the same time decarbonization. So this is why I remain to be a little more constructive, why I believe there's elevated uh, inflation in the world, and I, I think all of this is playing out. But back to our earnings, you know, we had a record amount of uh, assets, one, uh, $10.5 trillion. Yes. Um, all of it's our clients' money. Uh, more than 50% of it is retirement. Um, and we saw flows across the board worldwide. We had active flows where still, in many cases, active uh, outflows are occurring in the industry. We had inflows. Um, and, and so the resiliency of our business is only accelerating. For the first time in a long time, I noted our pipeline has never been stronger of noted wins that are going to fund in the future. And so what we see is acceleration in our business model. UBS bank analyst Erica Nigerian. She has a buy on J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo, a neutral rating on Citi. So let's just start there. Is that your take as well? Was it the guidance number? I mean, it's... It's unusual to see J.P. Morgan shares down as much as 5% in the early going after earnings, Erica. Yeah, absolutely. The street really went there in terms of how they were thinking about the revisions to net interest, net interest income, or NII. You know, keep in mind that J.P. Morgan and the other money center banks are asset sensitive. So the more cuts you take out of the forward curve, the more they theoretically earn. So the 89 billion number that was mentioned in the earlier in the earlier bid, I think the street was almost already you know above 90 for that metric, and so the 89 was a bit of a disappointment. And also, when asked, you know, if we took out the three rate cuts that were embedded in you know their guidance for the 89, what difference would that make? And we didn't really get a strong answer, a firm answer for J.P. Morgan. So I think that's really a big part of the disappointment. So part of it is simply the fact that we very well may not get three rate cuts this year and not getting a clear answer, I guess, in terms of what impact that's going to have on the bank. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing, too, is, you know, the provision is going to go up from consensus estimates. Those are, you know, for those are credit costs um, related to better credit card growth. The tax rate was higher. Expenses were a little bit higher because of the FDIC. So net-net, the stock is ripped into the print, and now you're not going to get a consequent EPS upgrade. I think that's why the stock is taking quite a breather here today. What about Wells Fargo? You seem more impressed with the number, although I don't think they upgraded net interest income based on FedPath either. They didn't, but their fee number was quite the blowout. So, you know, you're looking closely to see that if there were any sort of one-time idiosyncrasies in terms of what caused that blowout to consensus. But really what was happening there is they earned more in trading, they earned more in investment banking, um, and they just had overall strength in that line. And I think that's really, really important for the long-only narrative, the long-term shareholder narrative to the stock, right? Because, you know, clearly Wells Fargo is a, a fixer-upper, so to speak, as they deal, deal with the regulatory issues. And I think that beat in the fee revenue 
um, item essentially told the street, look, they were not just cutting costs, but they were cutting costs overall, but using some of those cost savings to invest back into the business. And as for net interest income, Sarah, um, I think it's too early for Wells Fargo to upgrade their NII guidance. So I think it's still potentially on the come, but JP Morgan not upgrading their NII guidance today makes me less confident that it is to come for Wells Fargo in the future. I'm, we, we have the Wells Fargo CFO on the next hour, and, and we'll talk to him about this. But just on the expense side, it, I think it was a miss on Wells Fargo, and, and they reiterated the long-term expense guide. I know that's been important for investors who are long this stock. What did we learn about expenses, both there and, and at some of the competitors? Yeah, I think there's not really um, anything to report. Usually the first quarter is seasonally higher. And for J.P. Morgan, um, for which was impacted by the FDIC, but for Wells and for City, you know, they're really reiterating the core expense run rate. Um, so nothing much to report there, as you know, other than the first quarter is typically seasonally higher.